This video is sponsored by Nebula. Support me directly while getting access to dozens of original series, early releases and more by following the link below. In February of 2023, thousands of Sikhs stormed the police station in the Indian state of Punjab, setting off a month-long manhunt for a charismatic preacher named Amrapal Singh. He rose to fame by demanding a new country, Khalistan. Pakistani sympathizers vandalized the Indian High Commission in London. In March, Sikh protesters in London raised the Khalistan flag above the Indian Embassy. In May, Paramjit Singh Panjawar, leader of the Khalistan Commando Force, was shot dead in Lahore, Pakistan. On the 18th of June, Hardeep Singh Nijar, head of a Canadian Gurudwara, a Sikh place of worship, was gunned down in the Gurudwara's car park in Vancouver. According to India, he was the leader of the Khalistan Tiger Force and the mastermind of many terrorist acts in India. His family claims he was a plumber and the loving father of two. In September, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau raised eyebrows when he said that Canada was pursuing credible allegations that the Indian government was behind the killing. Canada hasn't provided any evidence for the claim and India dismissed the accusations as absurd and motivated. Each nation has expelled their diplomats, India has warned its citizens against visiting Canada, and Indian media is enraged at the Canadian accusation. It's the most serious incident between the two countries in decades. Nijar supported Khalistan, an independent state for Sikhs, who are a minority religion in India. Sikhs make up about 1.7% of India's vast population of 1.4 billion, but they make up 60% of the Indian state of Punjab. For the Sikhs, the Punjab is their spiritual homeland. After India, Canada has the largest Sikh population in the world. The Canadian parliament has more elected Sikhs than the Indian one. The bloody 1947 partition of India and Pakistan, ending British colonial rule and a labour shortage in Canada encouraged many Sikhs to migrate there. Today there are almost 800,000 Sikhs in Canada. There's even a new migration wave of British Sikhs moving to Canada to flee the horrors of living in Britain. Khalistan is currently not a country and the borders of this theoretical state are kind of vague. Some maps look like this, others like this, but if you drew a line around where most Sikhs live it would look like this. Today the Khalistan movement is banned in India, which accuses Canada, the UK and the US of sheltering Khalistani terrorists. Few threats have devastated India like the Khalistan insurgency of the 1980s and 1990s. A dark chapter that left tens of thousands dead, unleashed tanks on one of Earth's holiest places and silenced India's most formidable Prime Minister. This movement appeared extinguished in the mid 90s only to rise again from the ashes, fueled by unresolved tensions and leap into the headlines in 2023. So what is Khalistan? Why has it resurfaced? And can fertilizer be blamed for it all? Well, let's find out. Separatists call it Khalistan. And tonight, mobs of Hindus have been attacking Sikhs. Was to declare a state of emergency, suspend parliament, impose censorship, and arrest hundreds of leaders of opposition parties. Credible allegations between India and the killing of a Canadian citizen. Jarnai Singh Vindranwali claimed the government was set on genocide. Wanted for murder. The terrorist attack was the deadliest in history until the 9 11 incident. Mrs. Gandhi is assassinated. <laughs> With over 25 million followers, Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion. Sikhism, pronounced like Sikh, Sikh, not Sikh, started here in Punjab, pronounced Punjab, not Punjab, Punjab, 500 years ago with this man, Guru Nanak. A guru in Sikhism is a spiritual leader. Guru Nanak rejected the major religions at the time, Hinduism and Islam, and preached something new. He preached that all humans, regardless of caste, race or gender were fully equal and that people should dedicate their lives to selfless service to their community. Every Sikh Gurudwara offers a langar, a free communal meal for all visitors. The Islamic Mughal Empire persecuted the early Sikhs and executed several gurus. So martyrdom and resistance against oppression are deeply important to Sikh culture. The 10th guru, Gobind Singh, named the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh holy book, as the final and eternal guru. A clever, if somewhat dark decision since a book can't be executed. In 1699, he created the Amrit Sanchar baptism ceremony, 
Baptized Six formed a new community, the Khalsa. Khalsa Six follow a strict code of ethics and wear the five Ks. They also take new surnames, sing for men and cower for women. Khalsa Six stand out visually on purpose so they can't hide and so they must stand up to injustice, which is why they always carry a karpan or sword a symbol of their duty to defend the defenseless. While turbans aren't a part of the 5Ks, six commonly wear them to cover their long hair, which are a part of the 5Ks, and they're an easy way to identify six. This was very condensed. I have a whole video on Sikhism if you wanna go learn more. The Khalsa Six became famous for protecting their Hindu neighbors. They fought the crumbling Mughal Empire until 1799 when Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the Lion of Punjab, seized Lahore and created the Sikh Empire. The Lion beat back British and Afghan invaders. His army of Sikhs, Muslims and Hindus were trained by imported European generals. In this multicultural empire, Sikhs made up only 8% of population. Maharaja Singh donated gold from Muslim mosques, Hindu temples and Sikh gurudwaras. He completely refurbished a golden temple in Amritsar, one of the holiest places in Sikhism. He covered it in actual gold. After Maharaja Ranjit Singh's death, the British invaded twice until they destroyed the empire in 1849. They absorbed the Sikh empire into their own, while also grabbing the Sikh's massive Kohinoor diamond for Queen Victoria. Impressed by the Sikh's military, the British recruited Sikhs into their own armies. Soon Sikhs, who compromised only 1% of India's population, made up 20% of the British Indian Army. From the blood-soaked trenches of the Somme, to Gallipoli, to Singapore, six fought and died alongside their British, Indian and Commonwealth comrades. In modern India, where they make up just 1.7% of the population, six make up 8% of India's military, and the Sikh regiment is the highest decorated regiment of the Indian Army, and six have served as presidents, prime ministers, and chiefs of the Army and Air Force. Six went on to be at the forefront of the Indian independence struggle and gave their lives at a disproportionately high rate. Okay, so it's 1940. The British Empire has ruled India for about 200 years and it hasn't exactly been a fantastic time for the Indians. The Indian National Congress led by Mohandas Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru is championing the massive Indian independence movement. On the 23rd of March 1940 in Lahore, another Indian independence party, the Muslim League, declared that an independent India should form two countries, a Hindu majority India and a Muslim majority Pakistan. The Sikhs were caught in the middle. The Sikhs felt that in a Muslim state they would be persecuted, but they also felt that in a Hindu majority state they would be assimilated. The Akali Dal, the primary Sikh political party, demanded a Sikh state for the protection of the religious, cultural and economic and political rights of the Sikh nation. If Muslims could have a Pakistan, then the Sikhs thought they should get a Khalistan. The problem for the Sikhs was that they only made up about 15% of the Punjab's population. Sikhs lived alongside Muslims and Hindus in mixed communities, so in no district in the Punjab were Sikhs the majority. Okay, so now it's 1947. Britain is essentially being forced out of South Asia and this guy, Lord Mountbatten, has been made Viceroy of India. His job was to divide British India into two countries. The problem is that Punjab and Bengal both have mixed Muslim and Hindu populations, so there's no clear division. The Sikhs who fought and died in Britain's armies and gave their lives for the Indian independence movement were regarded by British planners as a nuisance. The Punjab would be carved up without taking the Sikhs into consideration at all. The Akali Dal, realizing that Khalistan was never gonna happen, sided with the Indian National Congress. India would be an overwhelming Hindu country, but Nehru outlined that it would be secular and that minorities will be protected. Nehru promised that the brave Sikhs of the Punjab are entitled to a special consideration. I see nothing wrong in an area and a setup in the north wherein Sikhs can also experience the glow of freedom. I would like them to have a semi-autonomous unit. The partition plans were finished by the 9th of August, 1947, but Mountbatten kept the detail secret until August 14th, literally Independence Day, so all the celebrations were held and then the partition lines were revealed. On August 14th and 15th, India and Pakistan were born. Bengal and Punjab were sliced in half and the secrecy meant that no troops were prepared to mitigate the disaster. Rising bitterness touched off a series of mass killings that for sheer terror and savagery have never been surpassed in modern times. 
Large areas of cities were destroyed and hundreds of villages were burned. Tens of thousands of people were killed because of their religion. In a frightened, desperate attempt to save their lives, millions of Indians began a journey that over the months was to become the greatest mass migration in history. Leaving thousands buried along the road, millions of Hindus and Sikhs who had been living in Pakistan moved laboriously toward the east and the safety of India, while other millions of Muslims headed in the opposite direction, hoping to reach Pakistan before marauding bands of enemies would slay them and their families. Across India, 20 million people had to move across these new lines, leaving their entire homes and ancestral lands behind, never to return. By the end of it all, 1 million people died, and at least 3.7 million people went missing. No other Indian people paid such a high price to end colonial rule. Six were cut off from 150 of their holiest sites. The birthplace of Guru Nanak, the city of Nankana Sahib, and Lahore, the capital of the Sikh Empire, went to Pakistan. Amritsar, home of the Golden Temple, went to India. Okay, so it's 1948. Partition happened, Gandhi got assassinated, and most Sikhs now live in India, an independent, secular, and democratic nation with Nehru as its first prime minister. Prime Minister Nehru called upon leaders representing many shades of political thought and various religious groups to help build a modern democratic state. Once all the dust and chaos had settled, the Sikhs regrouped in East Punjab, now 62% Hindu and 35% Sikh. The Sikhs got busy and became one of India's most prosperous communities, raising Punjab's per capita income to the highest in the country. But Nehru backed out of his promise. The Sikhs did not get a state where they could experience the glow of freedom. India is a union, a federal democracy with a central government in New Delhi and separate state governments in each state with their own elections and powers. As a minority in Punjab, the Sikhs had little power. They feared that if Sikhs did not control their own state in this Hindu majority and Hindi speaking India, Sikhs would lose their traditions and language and assimilate into the larger culture. In 1950, India finished its constitution. In it, Sikhs were categorized as Hindus. Sikh leaders refused to sign it, but it went through anyway. The Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 also defined Sikhs as Hindus. This didn't exactly calm Sikh assimilation fears. They were determined to get a state, but the Congress party was dedicated to secularism and it refused to create a state on religious lines. The Sikhs had an idea. Most Sikhs spoke Punjabi, while the Hindus in the area mostly spoke Hindi. So a Punjabi-speaking state would be a Sikh state. So the Akali Dal demanded a majority Punjabi-speaking state, creating a movement called the Punjabi Subha. In 1949, the Sasha formula divided Punjab into Punjabi and Hindi-speaking zones, but it kept the entire state united. The language of the zone you are in would be the language taught in schools. Radical Hindu organizations rallied against this, advocating Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan leading Punjabi-speaking Hindus to declare Hindi as their native language in the 1951 and 1961 census. This was done to shrink the Punjabi-speaking zone. This didn't exactly help communal relations between Sikhs and Hindus. Most of India's states were reorganized on linguistic lines in 1953. For example, Tamil and Telugu speakers got Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. The exception was Punjab. The Akali saw this as religious discrimination, and their protests were massive. Tens of thousands would get arrested on purpose, they would strike, they would lay down on railway lines, some Sikhs would even fast unto death in protest. Then, on the 4th of July 1955, the police forced their way into the Golden Temple to arrest protesters. Sikhs at this point felt that the government in New Delhi was actively discriminating against them. In 1966, after the Sikhs played a vital role in the 1965 war with Pakistan, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, Nehru's daughter, agreed to split Punjab along linguistic lines, creating a Punjabi-speaking Punjab and a Hindi-speaking Haryana. This drastically reduced the size of the Punjab, but increased its Sikh population from 35% to 60%. However, instead of celebration, the Sikhs felt betrayed. Valuable resources like forests and mineral-rich mountains were allocated to Haryana and Himalchal Pradesh. Punjab's only resource left was its vast river waters, which were to be administered by Delhi, 
not by the Punjabis. Chandigarh, one of the wealthiest and happiest cities in India, is a planned city built in 1953 to replace Lahore, now in Pakistan, as Punjab's capital. The Sikhs expected the city to be given to the new Punjab. Instead, it was declared a joint capital for both Punjab and Haryana, but would be administered directly from Delhi. Darshan Singh Paruman went on hunger strike in 1969 in protest. His tragic death in October led to widespread protests. Under mountain pressure, Indira Gandhi agreed to transfer Chandigarh to Punjab, scheduled for 1975. However, in the early 1970s, India faced widespread protests and strikes. Indira Gandhi, in response, declared a state of emergency on the 26th of June, 1975. She suspended fundamental rights, censored the press, and arrested opposition leaders across India. She ruled by decree for two years. 50,000 Sikhs will be jailed without trial for protesting against the emergency. The promised Chandigarh transfer never happened. What did happen was that in 1976, Indira Gandhi issued an executive order, which divided the waters of the Ravi, Bees and Sutlej rivers among Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan and Delhi. Punjab was to be given only 24% of the water from its own rivers. Okay, so there's essentially a dictatorship in India. Sikhs are being arrested, states are fighting over water, but I want to talk to you about fertilizer. In the 1960s and 70s, the Green Revolution hit India, but mostly Punjab. The Green Revolution introduced high yielding varieties of wheat and rice. These engineered super seeds demanded industrial scale farming equipment, massive amounts of water and huge quantities of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides. Punjab, India's fourth smallest state, became India's breadbasket, saving the nation from famine and soon produced 70% of its wheat and 55% of its rice. But the profits of the Green Revolution mostly went to rich landowning farmers from a caste of six called Jats who make up about 50% of the Punjabi Sikh population. Sikhism as a religion is extremely anti-caste, but caste exists in spite of that. Rich farmers benefit from mechanized farm equipment, agrochemicals and hybridized seeds, but poorer farmers were encouraged to take on debt to buy all this equipment and fertilizers. The debt crushed them. Southern Punjab is the epicenter of an epidemic of suicide the mass suicide of the foot soldiers of the Green Revolution, death by high interest loans. Kamjit Kaur's husband swallowed pellets of poison two months ago. One of his friends told us he'd been a big man with a big personality who just drowned in debt. The government says you should not kill yourself this way, you should kill yourself that way. And we won't give you any money unless you do it this way. My nephew jumped off a building, cracked his head open and died. The government said he should have drunk pesticide. Then we'd have paid money. The government should just tell us how they would like us to kill ourselves. The debt crushed them and they lost their ancestral lands to rich landowners. By 1980, 10% of rural households controlled 75% of agricultural wealth. The super seeds also needed massive amounts of water. A lack of water would lead to economic and ecological devastation. So the Punjabis were quite sensitive to water rights. Farmers felt cheated that 76% of the water flowing through their rivers was diverted to neighboring states. These poor or landless peasants couldn't find other work because the industrial sector was purposefully underdeveloped. Between 1980 and 1985, only 0.04% of India's total budget for industry was invested in Punjab. Sikh peasants saw the benefits from their work flown to other parts of the country, while thousands of young, unemployed Sikhs had to emigrate to the UK and Canada. So what happened was, a new technological revolution took a society that was already self-sufficient and had its own rituals and traditions and social expectations and just crushed them with debt and landless poverty. So these engineered super seeds fed India but mutated social relations in the Punjab, causing debts, wealth inequality, and massive youth unemployment, which bred resentment. 
resentment directed at Delhi. So the emergency ended in 1977 and Congress was destroyed in the elections that year. In October of 1978, the Akali Dal adopted the Anandpur Sahib Resolution. It shows just how fed up six were. They demanded India be a real federation where states, not Delhi, ruled themselves. Delhi should only control defence, foreign relations, currency and communications. The resolution demanded that Chandigarh and other Punjabi speaking areas be handed over to Punjab and that Sikhism should be classified as a separate religion to Hinduism. It also demanded that the arbitrary and unjust award given by Miss Indira Gandhi during the emergency on the distributions of the Ravi Bees river waters should be revised. Brought back to power in 1980, Indira Gandhi imposed President's rule on Punjab. That means that she dismissed Punjab's elected government and ruled the state directly. This is where things fall apart. The Akali Dal's demands could have easily been met through India's federal system, but several problems stopped any progress being made. One, Indira Gandhi wanted a more centralised, not federal India. Two, Congress didn't want to lose votes in Haryana by giving in to Sikh demands. Three, the Akalis, despite being the primary political party for Sikhs, never enjoyed full support from all Sikhs. Their base was Jat farmers and some urban Sikhs. In no elections did the Akali Dal get more than 50% of the entire Sikh vote. The Congress party could rely on support from Hindus, non-Jats and people from disadvantaged castes, which Punjab has the highest density of in all of India. And four, no party had enough support to force the others to compromise. For years, the Akalis and Delhi were in negotiations. Arkishan Singh Sarjit, who was party to these negotiations, said three times in six months an agreement was reached and three times the Prime Minister backed out. Each time the interests of the Hindus in Haryana weighed more heavily with her than the Sikhs. So over the years, no progress was made on Sikh demands, which alienated people from the political process and created a power vacuum. A Sikh preacher called Jarnail Singh Bindranwale stepped into this vacuum. Bindranwale was a gifted speaker and preacher that skyrocketed to popularity in the late 1970s. He encouraged Sikhs to get baptised. The baptism rate for Sikhs rose from hundreds per week to thousands per day. And crucially, Bindranwale preached that baptised Sikhs should be Shastridharis or weapon bearers. He was connecting Sikh armed resistance to the Mughal Empire centuries ago to Sikh resistance against Delhi. Bindranwale himself was always seen wearing an ammunition belt. He harvested the anger at the effects of the Green Revolution, the Congress Party centralising policies and the Akalis inability to win their demands and his sermons build a narrative of an Indian state stealing wealth from Punjab, trying to Hinduize Sikhs and erase their culture. This resonated with rural Sikhs, especially Jats from struggling families that felt humiliated and cheated by their current life conditions. The Hindus are trying to enslave us. Atrocities against the Sikhs are increasing day by day under Hindu imperialist rulers from New Delhi. The Sikhs have never felt so humiliated. Bindranwale reinforced a Sikh identity and criticised Sikh men that cut their hair or didn't wear turbans. He earned even more followers by denouncing alcoholism, which was destroying rural Sikh families. If I had my way, you know what I would do to all those who drink whiskey shisky every evening? I would douse them in kerosene oil and set fire to the bloody law. As people flocked to Bindranwale and his somewhat puritanical version of Sikhism, he introduced a new element to Punjabi politics, violence. Don't buy televisions and refrigerators. When the Hindus come at you, are you going to hit them over the head with your TV antenna? You should obtain guns, submachine guns, bombs and grenades and kill all the suckers of blood. The Akalis were famous for their non-violent agitations, but the Akalis weren't winning. Disillusioned Punjabis were receptive to Bindranwale's claims that militancy was the way forward. But where on earth did this suddenly famous preacher come from? Surprisingly, he was originally created by 
the Congress party. This isn't some crazy conspiracy. This is like well documented. Jiani Zail Singh, a Congress member and future Indian president, along with Indira Gandhi's son, Sanjay Gandhi, provided financial and political aid to the obscure Sikh preacher after they lost the 1977 Punjab elections. Their aim was to destabilize the Akali government by creating an extremist religious movement, which would force the Akalis to either side with the extremists and lose moderates, or ignore the extremists and lose religious support. Bindranwale would also terrify Hindus, who might have stopped voting for Indira Gandhi and Congress after the whole rule by decree thing she did for a bit. So when Bindranwale's extremism escalated, Congress planned to crack down on them, save the Hindus, and paint themselves as strong leaders and launch them to victory in the next elections. But soon, Bindranwale's followers formed squads that eliminated the enemies of the Sikh faith. Nirankaris, a Sikh group he was at war with, communists, government servants, political opponents, suspected informers, and police were assassinated. Hindu and Sikh temples were attacked. On September 9th, 1981, Lala Jagat Narayan, a journalist that critiqued Bindranwale, was assassinated near the city of Ludhiana. The prime suspect was Bindranwale and his followers. On September 20th, Bindranwale made a dramatic surrender to the police before a crowd of thousands. In the riots that followed, police shot and killed dozens of Sikhs. By the end of the month, 10,000 Sikhs had been arrested. On the 29th of September 1981, five members of Dal Khalsa, an extremist Sikh organization allied with Bindranwale, hijacked India Airlines Flight 423 from Srinagar to Delhi and diverted it to Lahore. They demanded Bindranwale's release from jail. Pakistani commandos assaulted the plane as soon as it landed, which freed the 117 passengers on board and they arrested the hijackers. A month later, the government released Bindranwale. His jail time though only made him more popular. The government has done more for me in one week than I could have achieved in years. By the end of 1981, he was the most powerful man in Punjab. Congress then realized we had created a monster we could not control. But Bindranwale never demanded an independent Khalistan. We wish to live in Hindustan itself. It is the central government's business to decide whether it wants to keep the turbaned people with it or not. We want to stay. Bindranwale wanted the demands in the Anandpur Sahib resolution. On the 1st of May 1982, the government of India broke off talks with the Akali Dal and banned several Sikh organizations. Bindranwale and his followers retreated to the Golden Temple complex in Amritsar and it became their headquarters. Soon, weapons and armed militants were pouring into the complex. Among these militants were former soldiers, including Major General Shabeg Singh. This guy trained the Bangladeshi Liberation Army in the 1971 war that India joined to free Bangladesh from Pakistan. Shabeg Singh was a household name in India. Him joining Bindranwale and organizing the militant's defense in the Golden Temple complex is difficult for non-Indians to understand. This was a genuinely insane transition that really shows how Sikhs felt in India at that time. Indira Gandhi soon classified the Anandpur Sahib resolution as a secessionist document and vilified the entire Sikh community as anti-Indian terrorists. On October 6th, 1983, a bus in Punjab was ambushed by militants and six Hindu passengers were murdered. The president's rule was imposed on Punjab. Sikhs were now the national enemy of India. This was fairly awkward, since Sikh men held many influential positions in India. The president of India, Jiani Sal Singh, was a Sikh, and so were many of the most significant military leaders. Up until now, the patriotic credentials of the Sikhs were impeccable. Indians saw them as the sword of the nation, those that fought to protect India. Turning the Sikhs into terrorists jeopardized the entire Indian state. During the 1983 Asian Games held in New Delhi, the Haryana chief minister issued orders for the police to halt all Sikhs from entering New Delhi and to frisk them all to teach the Sikhs a lesson. Among those who were subjected to the ordeal of being stopped, searched and humiliated was Lieutenant General Jajit Singh Arora, a war hero that accepted the surrender of Pakistan after the 1971 war. Again, this is 
a crazy development. This would be like strip searching George Patton at the Los Angeles Olympic Games. Just, just like an incredible provocation. Branded terrorists, sick men were increasingly executed by police or extremist groups, creating a pattern of encounter killings, a term used by police to imply that the victim was killed in a violent encounter. In most cases, the encounters were staged and the victims were entirely innocent. All of this, especially the murders, justified Bindram Wiley's claims that six were second class citizens and he painted himself as the saviour of the six. The government calls me a terrorist, but I only fight government discrimination against six. In early 1984, the National Security Act was amended to allow detention of Punjabis without trial for up to two years. At the end of May 1984, Indira Gandhi, for the fifth time, abruptly terminated negotiations with the Akalis. Over 200,000 Sikhs have been arrested in the last 22 months. The president of the Akali Dal, Harchan Singh Longawal, was still dedicated to nonviolence and he delivered an ultimatum. Starting on the 3rd of June 1984, the lifeblood of India, Punjab's grain shipments, would stop. Punjab had become a powder keg just one spark away from devastation. On the 2nd of June, 1984, Indira Gandhi gave approval for Operation Blue Star, a military action to eliminate Bindram Wale. The army moved into Punjab. The border with Pakistan was sealed. Train services to Punjab were halted. Journalists were expelled. A total blackout enveloped the state. The Golden Temple complex at Amritsar had been completely fortified and rifle-wielding militants were prepared to fight to the death to protect Bintram Wale, who was located in a building called the Akal Tact. Operation Blue Star launched on the 3rd of June. On a normal day, the Golden Temple provides free meals to 100,000 visitors. But this was a Sikh holy day, the martyrdom day of Guru Arjan, a day where the Golden Temple complex was packed with thousands more pilgrims than usual. Men, women and children. There was no warning provided to the people that poured in. At approximately 10pm, the army sealed off the area around the complex. The pilgrims were now trapped inside between the militants and the army. June 4th erupted with artillery fire, reducing the Ramgarhia Bunga to ruins. Relentless shelling shattered the militants' defences and soldiers advanced in on their heavy sniper fire from militants. On the evening of June 5th, the army led by a Sikh, Lieutenant General Brar, sprayed bullets into and then breached the Golden Temple itself, which only housed pilgrims and priests. The militants, under the command of Shabak Singh, were in the heavily fortified Akal Tak and other buildings and they put up stiff resistance, inflicting heavy casualties which the army didn't expect. This was supposed to be a quick, clean and surgical elimination of Bindran Wale, and now the casualties were piling up. So Brar sought Delhi's approval for tank fire at the Akal Tact. Tank shells smashed into the militants' defences as pilgrims hid in their rooms throughout the complex. During all this madness, the Sikh reference library, holding 20,000 literary works and original writings from several gurus, was burned down. On June 6, the Akal Tank was again pummeled by tank fire. Special forces stormed the building at night. On the morning of June 7, Bindranwale, Shabek Singh, and dozens of other lifeless bodies were discovered inside. At the end of Operation Blue Star, bodies were strewn across the Golden Temple complex. One of the most important sites in Sikhism was now in ruins. Because the area was closed to reporters, it's difficult to assess the casualties. The government claims 493 civilians slash terrorists were killed and 83 Indian troops were killed. Independent estimates claim about 700 soldiers died and between 1,500 and 5,000 civilians were killed. Whether it's 493 or 5,000 or anything in between, it is a figure which is appallingly high 
for an operation conducted by an army against its own people. For six, seeing their mother India litter their holiest site with bodies felt like an all out assault on them as a people and it left a brutal scar on the Sikh psyche. 4,000 Sikh troops in the Indian army mutinied and thousands of Sikhs turned out from London to Vancouver to express their anger. On the 9th of June 1984, the Montreal Gazette quoted a Canadian Sikh protester. Previously, we did not support Khalistan. Now, we are supporting it openly. Operation Blue Star was the spark for the Khalistan movement. Bindranwale became a martyr causing a surge of recruits to the Khalistan cause, which barely existed before then. Six, once the heroes of India now began to see an independent Sikh nation as their only defense. At about 9.20 AM on the 31st of October, 1984, Indira Gandhi was walking through the gardens of the Prime Minister's residence in New Delhi on her way to an interview for Irish television. As she walked by her two Sikh bodyguards, they opened fire ending Indira Gandhi's 15 year reign over India with bullets, a chilling revenge for Operation Blue Star. Within days of Indira Gandhi's assassination, New Delhi became a cauldron of hatred. Collaborating with the police, Congress politicians orchestrated a brutal pogrom of Delhi's Sikh community. Mobs rampaged through the streets, targeting Sikh men, women and children who were subjected to horrific acts of violence, including being burned alive. Thousands of Sikh women were sexually assaulted. Officially, 2,700 Sikhs were killed, but the figure might be closer to 10,000 Sikhs murdered over the course of four days. These are normally described as riots, but these weren't riots. They were carefully organized and directed. The aftermath of this violence left at least 50,000 people displaced their homes and businesses reduced to ashes in the flames of hatred. Six remembered these killings and Operation Blue Star as the Galugugara or Holocaust. Indira Gandhi's son and successor Rajiv Gandhi appeared to condone the violence when he said, when a mighty banyan tree falls, the earth beneath it is bound to shake. Almost no perpetrators of these killings have ever been held accountable for their crimes. Members of the Congress party known to have organized the attacks were awarded with government positions. The police that took part were never punished, while many Sikh families were forced to live with the loss and trauma. This genocide remains an open wound. In organizing collective punishment of the Sikhs made them feel that like they had become second class citizens. On the 23rd of June 1985, Air India Flight 182, operating the Montreal, London, Delhi, Bombay route, was blown up by a bomb mid-air off the coast of Ireland. A total of 329 people aboard were killed, mostly Canadian citizens and mostly Hindus, although about 46 were killed as well. On the same day, a bomb was set off at Narita Airport in Tokyo, Japan, intended for Air India Flight 301, which killed two baggage handlers. The Khalistani group Babar Khalsa International were held responsible for the bombings. Before 9-11, this was the largest act of air terrorism and it remains the deadliest terror attack in Canadian history. Bindran Wale never advocated for an independent Khalistan, but after the killings, there was now a full on insurgency in Punjab, a war between the Indian government and Khalistani militants. But the Akalis still wanted a peaceful negotiation. Longawal, as the head of Akali Dal in 1985, condemned the acts of violence and repeatedly declared that the Akali Dal was not in favor of Khalistan. He came together with Rajiv Gandhi, now Prime Minister. The Rajiv Longawal Accords, signed on the 24th of July 1985, agreed to transfer Chandigarh, resolve the river water disputes, re-enlist the six soldiers that mutinied and bring the perpetrators of the Delhi genocide to justice. One month later, Longawal was assassinated by Sikh extremists. But right after that, the Akali Dal won a landslide electoral victory, which reflected widespread support for the Accord and peace within the Sikh community. Rajiv Gandhi, though, fearing a loss of Hindu votes, permanently postponed the Accord. No transfer, no re-enlistment, no justice. On April 29th, 1986, various Sikh separatist organizations and armed groups gathered at the Akal Takht and made a declaration of independence for 
Kalastan. The structure and borders of this Kalastan weren't really clarified, except that Sikhism would be the state religion. Punjab descended into vicious bloodshed at a rapid pace. In 1986, there are about 500 deaths related to the insurgency. In 1991 alone, there were 5,000. The diaspora provided the funding. General Zia ul Huq's Pakistan smuggled AK 47 assault rifles, rocket launchers, and explosive devices into Punjab. And so, violence by Sikh extremists continued to escalate. On November 30th, 1986, the Khalistan Liberation Force killed 22 bus passengers near the city of Hoshniapur. The Punjab's government was dismissed on the 11th of May 1987 and the state was once again placed under president's rule. Punjab would be directly ruled by Delhi for the next four years. The government, unwilling to meet Akali demands, resorted to force. Prominent Akali Dal members were arrested. The party lost all control of politics in the Punjab. On March 6th, 1988, the central government passed the 59th Amendment, suspending fundamental human rights and suspended Article 21 that said, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty. This allowed Sikhs to be detained and killed without evidence. Government forces unable to identify militants indiscriminately arrested Sikhs. Thousands of Sikhs were detained, tortured and often killed in encounters. Usually their only crime was having a beard and turban. Panjab police were given official approval to eliminate terrorists without oversight. On August 30th, 1989, the Panjab Police Director General offered rewards of $5,560 for killing hardcore terrorists. Julio Ribeiro, Director General of Panjab's police, summarized that the police's policy was to respond to bullets with bullets. The Khalistani militants responded with more bullets. Militant attacks were designed to maximize casualties, usually Sikh and Hindu civilians, such as on the 15th of June 1991 when militants opened fire on trains near Ludhiana, killing 110 passengers. In the first half of 1991, militant groups assassinated more than 24 political candidates. During the 1980s and early 90s, Villagers remained under constant fear of the terrorists as well as the police. Being sandwiched between the two, they remained bewildered and demoralized. In 1986, Gurmej Kaur's youngest son, Sukhdev, was arrested by police. It was a common phenomenon in Punjab then. Civilians were abducted, taken into illegal custody and tortured. Police accused Sukhdev of being involved in a murder case in Amritsar. He then spent seven months in jail before he was acquitted by a court. Sukhdev, by the way, was 12. By 1990, Gurmej Kaur's three sons, including Sukhdev and her husband, had been killed by police. We were not even given their bodies. They were cremated secretly. There are thousands of stories like this of Sikhs that suffered terrible injustices during the 80s and 90s. In 1995, Jaswat Singh Kalra filed a petition to the Indian Supreme Court claiming the police had cremated 25,000 unidentified bodies. Later that year, Kalra was killed by police. The state's excessive and unchecked force against Sikhs fueled the sense of persecution that fed militant ranks. For instance, Wasan Singh Zafarwal, chief of the Khalistan Commando Force, a militant group linked to several bank robberies and assassinations of communists, police and those who criticised Khalistan. Zafarwal initially had no interest in the movement and never followed Bindran Wale. He instead was radicalised by police harassment. As the police failed to end the insurgency, in 1991, 38 Indian Army divisions and security units, totaling about 250,000 personnel, entered Punjab, imposing army rule in major cities and conducting village-to-village -village sweeping operations. By 1995, the militancy had died out, but the capital transfer never happened. The water rights were never resolved and no justice was ever brought to the victims of Blue Star or the Delhi Genocide. So why did the Khalistan insurgency end? The overwhelming scale of state violence severely weakened the Khalistan movement. Thousands of Khalistanis, especially the leaders, were killed and their replacements lacked competence and ideological commitment. According to political science professor Hamish Telford, over time the militants increasingly engaged in robbery, extortion, rape, 
and indiscriminate killings. Narendar Singh, an old militant, said they ended up like street gangs. In 1999, terrorism in Punjab, understanding grassroots reality, did a survey on militant motivations, which revealed that for those recruited before 1985, over half were committed to Bindranwala's ideas. By 1990, it was 2%. By the end of the movement, the average age of a Khalistani militant was 22 and one in four was unemployed. Nearly 40% cited the trill of battle as their primary motivation to join. Another 12% sought financial gain, 11% were influenced by peers and only 5% joined to create Khalistan. Over 80% came from marginalized Jat farming families and 64% came from rural, poor and underprivileged backgrounds. This is pretty revealing because it shows us how the Green Revolution's impact fed the militancy and how the militancy struggled to create a Khalistan movement that appealed to non-Jats. Khalistanis never unified six into a modern liberation struggle, which meant that over time it lost direction. It also sadly reveals that the movement could have been stopped non-violently if the economic conditions in Punjab were changed. With its ideological leaders dead, the Khalistan movement fragmented into factions that targeted each other and innocent Sikhs, which alienated the people. By the 90s, Sikh civilians accounted for 70% of all militant attack victims. Mazabi Sikhs, considered lower caste by some Jats, were often targeted. Non-Jat Sikhs were opposed to what they saw as Jadistan. They knew they had more in common with Hindus, Christians and Muslims of similar economic standing. Sikhism is a religion built to defend the defenseless. Within a few years, Sikhs in the Punjab rejected violence and turned on the militants. One of the fiercest militants, Wasan Singh Zafarwal, said once the villages turned against us, we knew it was over. Today there are no agreed on figures of the overall debt rate that also includes all of the people that disappeared, but most likely the violence between 1984 and 1995 took about 40,000 lives. This includes approximately 30,000 civilians, 7,628 militants, 1,769 police officers, and 1,700 soldiers. In the 90s, the Akalis regained political control of Punjab by adopting a strategy that emphasized the common Punjabiat or Punjabiness of all, Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians and others, and they pushed for populist economic policies to revive the agrarian and urban sectors. In the 1996 parliamentary elections, the Khalistan Focus Party received just 3% of the vote and won zero seats. The movement? was dead. Or at least it was dead in India. In Punjab, the active insurgency is over, but for many diaspora Sikhs who left India due to events like Operation Blue Star and the violence that followed, the memories of their community's suffering and a desire for Khalistan endures. After the 1984 Golden Temple attack, some diaspora Gurudwaras were taken over by Khalistanis, becoming platforms for Khalistani recruitment. The Khalistan narrative resonated because it was rooted in real atrocities committed against Sikhs. Gurudwaras displayed photos of recent Sikh martyrs from the Punjab alongside historical Sikh martyrs, creating a centuries-long narrative of Sikh oppression. Even today, it isn't odd to see killed Khalistan militants on massive banners outside some Canadian Gurudwaras like the one outside of Hardeep Singh Nijar's Gurdwara, which had an image of Talwinder Singh Parmar, who was behind the Air India Flight 182 bombing. This has caused widespread condemnation by most of the Canadian Sikh community. Websites like Six for Justice share stories of Operation Blue Star and the massacres of Sikhs, which reach a younger, often religiously lax Sikh generation, while graphic images of the tortured bodies of Indian Sikhs by the Indian government circulate freely online that help maintain a sense of oppression and injustice. Many Khalistani activists like Nijar are labelled as terrorists under India's Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which means that they will be detained without trial if they ever travelled to India. This doesn't exactly calm the diaspora Khalistani's sense of Indian persecution. The Khalistan movement in the diaspora, especially Canada, the US and UK, has probably done more to organise a modern, unified liberation movement with referendums and popular websites, votes and general work with the community, 
much more than happened in the Punjab. However, in the diaspora, the Khalistan movement faces the same problems it faced in the Punjab. Division. Khalistan Council wants a secular Khalistan state, while Babar Khalsa International demands an orthodox Sikh theocracy. And the movement's influence is constantly challenged by non-Jats who are often disinterested or openly hostile to Khalistanis. However, the Canadian state has essentially ignored Khalistan movement or even tacitly support it, even though it's mostly through a complete lack of knowledge and unwillingness to learn about what they consider to be a foreign problem. India has accused Canada of supporting and harboring Khalistanis, enabling the movement's survival outside of India. While Khalistan seems to be more popular outside Punjab, the larger Sikh diaspora disassociates itself from the pro-Khalistan sentiment. That's why some Sikhs have protested against Khalistan supporters overseas. While only a small percentage of the Sikh diaspora is calling for Khalistan, it reverberates because they are loud. Almost four decades have passed since Operation Blue Star and the insurgency, fading these events into distant yet painful memories for many. For the nearly 40% of Punjabis under 35, the insurgency is history. Nearly 40% of the state's population now live in urban areas, and the agricultural workforce declined from 62% in 1971 to 30% in 2011, which has eroded the once dominant rural agricultural villages and traditional Jat society, the old base for the Khalistani movement. Today's Punjab has different priorities, but while the Khalistan movement was crushed, the problems that spawned it were never resolved. In 2020, the Modi government in India brought in a new agricultural legislation that would deregulate the industry and potentially impact farmers' income. Tens of thousands of protesters, led by Punjabi farmers, marched on Delhi in what might be the largest protest in living memory. While the protesters were defending their livelihoods, the government tried to delegitimize the protests by calling them Khalistanis. Social media exploded in India, where many right-wing accounts called for a repeat of the 1984 genocide against six. One popular tweet was, a tree had fallen in 1984 and the earth shook. He, Modi, is Mount Everest. There will be total devastation. This is a reference to what Rajiv Gandhi said to justify the massacres of 1984. Six were once again made aware of how quickly they could be turned into the national enemy. A sticker popular across Punjab read, We are farmers, not terrorists. The year-long farmers' protests eventually forced the government to repeal the laws. Six are still struggling to secure their separate and unique identity. While the Indian National Congress was at least nominally secular, the BJP sees India as a Hindu state, one of a Hindu Jagriti or awakening, and openly calls for India to be governed by the great teachings of the Vedas. The Vedas are the holy texts of Hinduism. This is quite appealing to many Hindu voters. The BJP is by far the most popular party in the country. In this video though, I'm trying to explain the Sikh perspective, and I hope you can see how this might be quite concerning to Sikhs. Modi has actually done a lot to try and win Sikh votes to the BJP cause more than most other prime ministers. But the party's Hindu nationalist rhetoric and the Hindu nationalist insistence that Sikhs are Hindus continues to alienate Sikhs. Prime Minister Modi's call for a Hindu nation has many Sikhs saying, if you can call for a Hindu nation, why can't we call for a Sikh one? Four decades after Blue Star, a new call for Khalistan has emerged, led by a self-styled Sikh preacher, Amrapal Singh. After a decade of living in Dubai, Singh returned to Punjab in September of 2022 and rapidly built a following around himself which calls for an independent Khalistan. Singh led marches calling for the protection of Sikh rights and started a religious revival, encouraging hundreds of Sikhs to get baptised into the Khalsa. He travelled the state accompanied by supporters carrying automatic rifles. In his rhetoric and appearance, Singh was clearly attempting to be Bindranwale 2.0. Singh's preaching environment is almost identical to Bindranwale's. Punjab has fed India for generations, but suffers the consequence of the Green Revolution alone. Farmers weren't told the effects of all these chemicals. Punjab grapples with high rates of cancer, renal failure, stillbirths, and birth defects. 15,000 farmers committed suicide due to debt worries from 2000 to 2015. In 2016, farmer suicides in Punjab rose by 118%. There is still very little industrialization in the state, which has an 8% unemployment rate, and as we saw before, 
unemployment was a common factor among militants. 2017 study found that the majority of young Punjabis have problems with drugs or alcohol, with more than 20% addicted to heroin. This neglect, combined with rising fears of Hindu supremacy, can create a collective sense of discrimination and radicalize people. One of the first things Amrapal Singh did when he reached Punjab was to set up a drug rehabilitation center. In the same way that Bindram Wale was anti-alcohol, Singh has managed to gather followers with his anti-drug campaign. Amrapal Singh paints Khalistan as the permanent solution to Punjab's drug addiction, mass emigration, economic woes and fears of young Sikhs abandoning tradition. He promised a Punjab that kept its wealth rather than seeing it siphoned off to Delhi. It's a message as powerful today as it was in the 1980s. In February of 2023, Amrapal and his followers, armed with guns and swords, attacked the Ajnala police station in Punjab to break out a prisoner. A manhunt began to arrest him. In March, Indian authorities shut down internet access into Punjab's 27 million inhabitants for days while they searched for Amrapal. After avoiding capture for 35 days, he was arrested with 200 others. Amrapal is currently serving a prison sentence in Assam. Some in India have argued that individuals like Singh, who suddenly emerged from Dubai and the recently killed Nijar in Canada, are tools of Pakistan. Pakistan undoubtedly supported the Khalistan movement in the 80s and 90s, which may explain why few Khalistani groups claim any territory in Pakistan, despite significant Sikh heritage being there. Hamid Ghul, who led Pakistan's intelligence agency, stated, keeping Punjab destabilized is the equivalent of the Pakistani army having an extra division at no cost to the taxpayers. Whether Pakistan's support continues today remains uncertain. Strategically, Pakistan wouldn't actually want an independent Khalistan. They just want to weaken India. The Indian media often blames the entire Khalistan movement on Pakistan, but Pakistan can't create a whole movement. They can only opportunistically add fuel to the fire that India has refused to put out. Some are worried that the internet shutdown and the arrest of more than 200 people was too harsh. Kiran Kaur said, once you put them in jail, you radicalize them for life. The hurt from 1984 and the insurgency still continues, and this hurt can be directed by anyone with political skill or mismanaged by someone that lacks it. Currently, 95% of Punjabi Sikhs express pride in being Indian, and 70% believe that disrespect in India contradicts Sikh identity. But legislation perceived as taking away Punjab's wealth or disenfranchising its people, political parties playing with people's lives to earn votes, the rise of a Hindu first ideology, concerns about urbanization and the eroding of Sikh traditions, and the lingering absence of justice for those affected by Blue Star and the Delhi genocide could easily be a potential catalyst for future trouble, especially if the diaspora is willing to fund it. And branding the Sikh community as Khalistanis or terrorists whenever politically convenient without addressing these issues could threaten India's stability. Managing these issues is crucial because Punjabis know that if the militancy returns, it will be them that suffers. To ensure that the militancy never returns, Khalistan expert GBS Sidhu emphasizes the need for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Punjab like in South Africa. This commission should investigate the tragedies and inform Sikhs of what happened between 1984 and 1995. Questions like the actual death toll of Operation Blue Star, accountability for those that took part in the Delhi genocide, and details about police encounters in the Punjab must be answered. Punjabis need to know what happened to missing loved ones. A veteran reporter, Gobind Tukra, stated, closure hasn't taken place at the level of state and society. And until that sense of closure is extended to six, the Khalistan movement will persist, its embers smoldering, ready to ignite at any moment. You just watched an hour-long documentary on the Khalistan conflict. I remember as a kid growing up that I loved documentaries like this. Learning about the world and its history fascinated me. It seems though that popular television has abandoned well-made documentaries for cheap sensationalism or reality TV, and independent creators that want to make good educational content 
have picked up the slack. That's one of my favorite things about Nebula, an independent streaming service owned by creators like me and is packed with the best documentaries online. Nebula offers you videos by professionals like actual lawyer Devin at Legal Eagle and actual engineer Brian from Real Engineering who provide expert insights into those fields through their videos. But it also offers you well-crafted documentaries made by independent creators. Documentaries researched and written with accuracy in mind and with visuals to help break down complicated subjects like the Nebula original series, The Logistics of X. Created for Nebula by Wendover Productions, which explains complex industries like how Saudi Arabia handles millions of pilgrims going on Hajj every year, or how the global arms industry works. Real Engineering's documentaries on World War II are a visual treat that tackles things like D-Day from a rarely seen point of view. Modern conflicts will help you understand topics like the Lebanese Civil War. Real science can teach you how something like sweat made humans an apex predator. And City Beautiful's Great Cities original series will give you a whole new appreciation for how cities like Shanghai function. And those are just a taste of the available Nebula originals. Exclusive content produced just for Nebula. Produced with quality rather than clicks in mind. Nebula doesn't only offer originals though. The 100 plus Nebula creators all have their YouTube content available on Nebula ad free and many of them upload their videos on Nebula days and sometimes weeks in advance. This video was on Nebula days ago and creators like Johnny Harris and Jetlag videos are on Nebula first long before they hit YouTube. So if you want to watch some of the best documentaries online, want to watch videos ad free or you simply want to hear Wendover Productions explain the global arms trade in the best way possible, while supporting this channel, then go to my link, go.nebula.tv slash cogito. Using that link, you'll get a 40% discount on an annual subscription, which makes it just $2.50 a month, a fraction of the cost of most streaming sites, for the best educational content online on a platform owned by the creators. But wait, there's more. This holiday season, unwrap the gift of knowledge with Nebula Lifetime Memberships. We've recently started selling these in limited batches and they've been incredibly popular. So right now, just for the holiday season, for a one-time payment of $300, you'll get access to Nebula forever. You can snuggle up on these cold December nights with a hot cup of cocoa as Polymatter explains China's nuclear policy to you in his original series, China Actually. You can do this with peace of mind knowing that with a lifetime membership, you'll never have to worry about managing your subscription again. And this holiday season, Nebula is offering lifetime membership gift cards so you can share the gift of Nebula with your loved ones and both get addicted to the new season of jet lag together. With lifetime memberships, you get endless and unlimited access to hours upon hours of current and future Nebula content. And the lifetime memberships are a way for us to raise capital for new and even more ambitious original projects. Use my link below to grab these exclusive holiday offers and support independent original creators. Oh, and one last thing. Lots of you supported me last year by signing up for the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle. The annual renewal for that is coming up and I need to tell you that if you renew that bundle for 2024, you'll still get access to both, but CuriosityStream will not be sharing the subscription fee with Nebula. Since many of you signed up for that bundle in part to support Nebula creators, the best way to do that now is to sign up directly with Nebula using my or another Nebula creators link. I know this is kind of confusing and I apologize, and since Nebula doesn't want anyone to have to pay twice, if your bundle did renew, you can still purchase an annual direct Nebula subscription today at a discounted rate of $30, and we won't start the clock on your subscription until your bundle actually access expires. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. It was very long and I still had to leave a lot of context out. It's kind of impossible to include everything in a topic as complex as this. If you did like this video, leave a comment. A link to my Patreon is also down below if you want to help support this channel. All patrons get early access and get to join a Discord server with me and other patrons. Another way you can support this channel is by sharing the video. Sources I use are also in the description.